welcome. We are live. Welcome to another round of the OAuth Happy Hour. Always a good time here. I'm Aaron, and we have Vittorio here as well. Hi. <laughs> uh, it's been a while, so I'm sure there's a lot to catch up about, and uh, a lot of interesting things have happened in the world of OAuth that we can catch up on. And um, I think we have a few other little fun updates to share as well. So with that, um, as always, if you do have questions, uh, feel free to drop questions in the chat and we'll, we're happy to take questions as well. But we're also going to be just sort of sharing what's new in the OAuth group. Uh, what are the recent updates to any of the OAuth specs that have happened, um, of which now there have been a couple. Things are kind of back and rolling again. And uh, what's new in the world of OAuth in the news as well? And there was a um, massive Facebook outage on Monday, which uh, has some interesting implications in the world of OAuth as well. So it should be a fun, a fun hour for, uh, for everybody who's here. So with that, um, let's start with the, let's start with the easy stuff. Get that out of the way first. Updates from the OAuth group. So this has been the, uh, we've, we've had kind of a, uh, slower summer as you know, everybody's on vacation and, and, taking time, which is fine, but things are back. It is the fall, it is October, and we are um, back back in business here. So the in this month of October, there are a series of interim meetings, which are where the group um, meets what would have been a face-to-face -face is still virtual and uh, discusses a particular topic in depth. So giving updates on a particular draft, talking about um, what's new in that, and then also hopefully getting to discuss some of the open issues and resolve and move things forward in those drafts. So right. we've actually already... Right. Uh, mailing lists oh. are not always the best way of uh, uh, gathering consensus or getting the temperature yes. of the room and yeah. uh, having uh, this uh, high bandwidth from time to time, like at least uh, twice a year, is not a bad thing at all. Definitely, definitely helps having some actual um, FaceTime, which is still virtual, but still that is different, very different than mailing list interactions. So the yeah. first of the series was yesterday uh, talking about the new new draft, individual draft HTTP signatures for OAuth, which is uh, one of Justin Richards' drafts. And this draft is a uh, applying HTTP signatures to OAuth. Oops, those are his slides. I meant to show the draft. And uh, applying HTTP signatures to OAuth, which is something that has not really been done before and is still very experimental. And uh, also because the HTTP signatures draft is still very experimental. Yeah, maybe we should uh, zoom out a bit for mm -hmm. the people that aren't following very closely what happens in the ITF, including myself. <laughs> like, yeah. uh, I learned about these, uh, like I knew that this was happening, by osmosis, but uh, I actually looked it up once I've seen that uh, mm. there was this stuff coming up. So the idea is that uh, um, Justin and Annabelle from AWS are working with the HTTP group, so lower level than the OAuth level, on a mechanism for performing and validating signatures for HTTP messages. So there is this generic mechanism, very powerful, that uh, you can use for selecting parts of a message, selecting the kind of key that you want to use, the algorithm and similar, attach the signature to your message and send it out, and then instructions. And here, correct me if I'm wrong, Aaron, but I think that uh, Justin in the past had another um, draft, which uh, was meant to perform proof of possession with uh, uh, OAuth. Let's say that it was a mechanism for uh, showing when you are using a token that you know a particular key. And basically, that would have uh, eliminated a number of the challenges that you have uh, when you use a better token. And the meeting that we were having, uh, yeah, was it yesterday or today? It was, it was yeah. Oh, <laughs> <it's> like <laughs> crazy. And it was about uh, whether that uh, all the draft, which is expired, by the way, of like doing proof of possession with off should be abandoned 
and instead a new one, which is uh, trying to achieve the same goals, but using HTTP signatures, which as Adam mentioned, are still also not RFC. They're still being discussed, but they're not yet a standard. Uh, whether we should drop the old uh, proof of possession and work on a new one, which uses HTTP signatures as, uh, let's call it the mechanism of uh, performing the proof of possession. Is that fair? That is that is fair. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The and I guess backing up one level further, the idea of proof of possession is, uh, I guess you did summarize it, but it's the idea of having some sort of key that you do not actually send in your request, you instead sign something so that it, so that it, you, when you protect that key properly, it is, it is sure the, the server receiving that message is sure that it actually is that thing sending the message and not something else that is stolen an access token. And the big problem here that these are all trying to solve this whole realm of proof of possession is the problem of stealing access tokens. Because if it requires signing something with the key and the key can't be extracted, then there is no longer a problem with stealing access tokens. And frankly, this has not really been solved well currently. This does not, there's not a super great solution. There's really only one that is an RFC and, um, I would not say that is widely deployed. It is mutual TLS, where the client has a TLS certificate that it uses when it establishes the TLS connection and the access token can be sort of a, associated with that certificate. And that's really only one that exists other than the handful of experiments that have happened that have all either expired or just disappeared. So shameless plug. The very first episode of uh, the Identity Unlocked podcast was with Brian Campbell, and uh, we spent the entire episode exploring the space of uh, sender mm. constraints, which is the collective name of this. And Brian was uh, very nice and patient and walked us through MTLS, which he just described, and uh, a mention of token binding, which is a basically dead attempt to achieve the same by tying to a SSL layer rather than uh, explicit certificate. Depop, which is instead a very nice and fashionable, which is a lightweight uh, way of uh, doing proof of possession with a uh, dynamic key uh, generation. And in general, it's an interesting space and a fast moving one. And uh, this idea of using HTTP signatures this way is uh, largely uh, playing in the same space, which uh, if we report on the early reactions on the mailing list, seems to be something which is uh, concerning for a number of people in the working group. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So the HTTP signatures has nothing to do with OAuth by itself. It is really just a spec about signing an HTTP message, which also means it has lots of applications outside of OAuth. And that's a really important aspect here is that that spec is not meant to be tied to OAuth. The concept of signing HTTP messages is useful in a wide variety of things. The OAuth group in particular would like a form of proof of possession uh, that is, you know, easy to write code for, easy to deploy, and HTTP signatures, if it were existing already, would be a good option. And that's sort of what this draft was trying to do: was say, okay, let's say this thing exists, and let's say it does go forward and does become standard. What would it look like to use it in OAuth? So that's the particular draft we were talking about yesterday. Was the application of HTTP signatures in OAuth, so all these layers. Um, but but yes, the uh, it look, does look like the initial response on the mailing list was not super positive. Uh, mainly the concerns sounded like um, it's too experimental to, to adopt uh, at the moment, and also that signing things and canonicalizing things is hard. Those are the two sort of main points I heard. Yeah, there are a few, and there is also the aspect of uh, um, confusion, as in uh, um, all those methods, like, uh, you're right, M M MTLS is the only one that is officially RFC, and uh, there is a bit more impetus behind it, because uh, FAPI1, the financial APIs, require it, and so some of the financial institutions that want to comply, they have supported, no matter how hard, and so it's seeing a bit more traction. But apart from these very bright lines, as in like uh, 
you've got to do it or you're not getting certified, then there is uh, a lot of confusion about like, uh, okay, let's pretend that Depop actually becomes a standard. How do I distinguish, like, how do I decide when to use uh, Depop versus using uh, this thing with HTTP signatures? And like, uh, Justin made uh, some argument which uh, uh, have a solid roots, I believe, in security considerations. But we know that uh, some of this stuff is kind of like uh, the nuance when you give guidance to people is a bit lost. And we tend to always go toward uh, simplicity. Like, for example, people try to argue that you don't need Pixie everywhere. And then we found the place in which, yes, it shows that you do need it. But for a while, people pushed back. Uh, but ultimately, people seem like others said, you know what, let's just make it simple. Let's just ask for it everywhere. And so here, we might see some similar mechanisms in which uh, if the difference between a DPOP and HTTP signatures is not easy to explain to the mm -hmm. uh, non of cognizant developer, then uh, that might be another reason for which uh, maybe it makes sense to wait until at least HTTP signatures are enshrined in the RFC Olympus or whatever you say in English. Yeah, yeah. I um it's it's definitely a tough one. Um personally, my my own personal feelings on this are I would love to see HTTP signatures exist and be a thing on its own because that means that it would very likely then be built into HTTP libraries like curl where it would then be super easy as a developer to just be like, "Hey, also sign this message." Like, "Here's my key file, please go sign this message." And you wouldn't really have to do anything. And ideally, there would also be the corresponding code on the server side to be able to validate the signature. And it would all be at that layer of the HTTP client itself, meaning I don't have to write application layer code in order to make that work. That's my that I would love to see that. But we are not there yet because the spec is brand new and it I, there's no telling, you know, how long it would take for a client library like curl to adopt it, even if the RFC comes out. So that's yeah, it, it is a challenge. Yeah. I, I hear you. And actually, as you were talking, I was reminded of, uh, remember when uh, JavaScript had uh, no crypto whatsoever and you had to build everything uh, like uh, yeah. from scratch. You'd have to like yeah. to use uh, basic uh, math uh, and uh, integer uh, arithmetic to build uh, crypto. And then uh, once they started featuring uh, crypto APIs, so many things got uh, so much easier. And Signatures might play a similar role. I'd be really interested to also see how the market would uh, react. Because like, good to have something that we are so confident that it's so polished that you can actually call it a standard. But then we know that the market will uh, pick and choose what are the things that they want to use the most. And uh, mm -hmm. also, I see potential synergies with other things like we're both on like uh, places where the browser already is paddling with crypto or like access to the secure elements on the machine and flows in which the user is involved. Because like if you need the user to uh, unlock access to your key material. Uh, so I think that uh, yeah. this yeah. is a technology which can be incredibly powerful and incredibly empowering, but I would love to see what people use it for first. So gets the standard, gets enshrined in libraries, and then see what people do when they are using it. And then we can build uh, on top of that even further with more confidence that what we are doing is actually what people want, to, what the market wants, as opposed to that, what we imagine. Yeah, so yeah, I think that's a good, that's a good summary of, of that session. The, um, the minutes are posted online if anybody wants to go and see more of the discussion and Justin's slides are online as well. So you can dig into the details. Um, the best place to go to find that would be the, well, there's the actual um, meeting page on the IETF. So I will drop that link into the chat. And, and Justin um, did a great job. Like uh, he, did. he did a little retrospective. He explained how signatures work in a very concise way. Those are great slides. So if you want to catch up, uh, I think that the both sides will really help. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But let's move on 
to um, our next our next topic. Well, I guess let's just quickly uh, summarize the 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 work the the work that's coming up in the in the next interim meetings, which we will I'm sure talk about on another another happy hour here. But uh, without getting into the details of all these, because there's way too many of them, um, the the new drafts that have been updated are these these ones up at the top here. So these are all going to be the topics of the next couple of, of meetings. Um, we've got a new draft of OAuth 2.1, uh, authorization server issuer identification. We've mentioned that a couple of times. Um, the DPOP we talked about, that's the sort of other alternative to HTTP signatures. And then uh, rich authorization requests got an update and JSON with token response for token introspection, mouthful. Um, but look at all this new work happening. So that's really great to see. The um, the sessions coming up are uh, right now. These are the ones that are scheduled. OAuth 2.1, rich authorization requests. I'm super excited by that one. Also, and Depop has one at the end of the month. So uh, it's possible we'll get another meeting or two out of that uh, as well that just aren't on the calendar yet. I'm ready to bet that just like last time, the 2.1 will run long and we'll have to book a second one. Because like. Uh, the surface that you cover into that one is just so large. Yeah. And uh, yeah. you are like uh, taking this opportunity to revisit some things which are uncontroversial, but even just the language. And so you're yeah, like uh, uncovering some of the stuff that. Uh, uh, so I think that uh, we'll have uh, a lot of uh, healthy discussion about it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um... So yeah, that's the updates from the world of OAuth. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Facebook. I think that's an interesting one because I didn't actually see much discussion about those implications in the uh, or the OAuth implications in in the Facebook outage. So on Monday this week, Facebook had a massive outage where they basically deleted themselves from the internet and. Uh, it was an accident, and they were just gone for... It was a long time. It was several hours. Six hours. Was, six hours. Six hours. Okay. Six hours of just being not on the internet. And the... Uh, it's one thing when you have, like, you know, your random... One random website goes down. Fine. Um, but Facebook is not just a random website, and it is a lot more than just cat photos. And it is also, in fact, used as a way to sign into other things. A lot of people do rely on the sign in with Facebook button. And that's the thing that caught my attention of like, well, if Facebook is down, then all of the sign in with Facebook buttons are also down. And that can have a lot of implications outside of Facebook because you can use your sign in with Facebook to get into all sorts of different things. And really the, the sort of the only the result here was that you just couldn't click that button. The button would just go to nothing and you're you're stuck. So it's tricky because this is always the like, oh well you don't want to uh you know is is it is it worth relying on an external provider for logging into your app? Or are you better off building your own provider or running your own provider or just using a password? And you know that's a constant struggle with developers of like it, which is the right way to go. And then you see stuff like this happen and you're like, well, maybe I should have just rolled it myself. Right. Well, of course, like uh, the ones here is uh, like, first I'd say that like it was a uh, cringe worthy because like uh, those are uh, people like us working in uh, IT and no matter how much I uh, hate we are getting on the media, uh, those are engineers that were struggling for six hours. Uh, I heard that the Telegram gained 70 million new users in six hours. 70 new million oh is more God. than the population of my native Italy. It's like yeah. mind boggling. But anyway, uh, like so they deserve our sympathy and similar. And it was pretty funny to see some of the memes like uh, uh, the Twitter founder tweeting, uh, uh, Welcome everyone, and I mean literally everyone. Literally, <laughs> and stuff like that. But uh, there were also other things that uh, I found uh, infuriating, as in uh, 
people that uh, know kind of like enough to be dangerous and then chimed in with very um, categorical, like very, I like to say, dogmatic, extreme views as you're like, oh yeah, that's, uh, it's stupid to rely on external, like, dude, you have no mm -hmm. idea. Like, like everything, this thing has uh, uh, pros and cons. Like whenever you outsource a critical function, to an external uh, element in your architecture, you are going to uh, be tied to the SLA of that thing. And this thing is not just for the identity provider, but it's for everything. Like uh, a recent example is uh, platform authenticators. You can sign in to a website, sign up to a website, sorry. And uh, if a website understands that you are on a device that has a uh, web often platform like uh, Face ID or uh, um, Touch ID or like I have various others <laughs> hanging around, uh, then it can let you just come in and it's going to be super easy, super simple. You just look at this thing and boom, you are in. But if that's the only mechanism that you put together, then if you migrate to a new device or you lose your device or like uh, you forget to resolve, you are going to be dead in the water because it's just the nature of this, which is why normally for this kind of stuff, we have alternatives. If no website, apart from the most crazy ones, will allow you to sign up only with a platform authenticators, like uh, with keys, they let you because uh, you can move them around and similar. But when it comes to... Um, to platform authenticators, you almost always need to provide a, another, another factor so that if something happens, because you need to expect that something will happen, then you have something you can fall back to. That's one consideration. And then the other consideration is that uh, sign-in is not always a fungible operation. Let's say that uh, for us uh, professionals, very often we abstract away and we say, OK, here there is an app. You want uh, users to access their records on your app. And so something needs to happen for those records to come back online. And so I could send you to Facebook. I could send you to GitHub. I could send you to our Amazon Pay, whatever. So it doesn't matter as long as we do this. But very often, that's not what happens, especially given that here we are on off. The thing is, uh, very often, you sign in with a particular provider because you want to also call APIs for that provider. Like if you are on Google uh, uh, and you want to use Google Calendar, or if you are uh, using OneDrive because your files are on OneDrive, the sign-in is not just the sign-in. It's also unlocking your ability to call this stuff. And so in the case of sign-in, you can do remediations. Like, uh, OK, I'm treating for social providers like uh, a factor, an authentication factor. And so as such, I also have my uh, fallback uh, using the authenticator app, for example, in an OTP. So that when that provider is not there, it doesn't. But there will be times in which you will be unable to because uh, you are leveraging other things that are unlocked by that particular provider. So I ran over. I don't want to suck the oxygen out of the air. But what do you think, Aaron? No, no, it makes a lot of sense. And I think the, um, you're absolutely right that the, at least having a recovery method, if not an actual method to sign in is something that a lot of people are, will, will do as they're building up these things, because they're not going to rely on only one factor. And yeah, treating like a social login as a factor is probably a good approach there of like, you have your sign with Facebook path and that you, that might disappear because the user might their account shut down or delete their account, for example, and you need, you know, if they want to get it back into their account they used, uh, they used Facebook to get into, that you need something else. So if you've got their email address, you can at the very least always send them an email magic link they can click, right? Uh, and get back into their account that way and set up a new authentication mechanism. But definitely it's something to think about as you're building. Um, it's, I don't think it's by any means a bad idea to rely on external providers, identity providers for this, because it does simplify things quite a lot. But being prepared for 
not just outages, but even the user voluntarily deleting their account is important, very important. Oh, absolutely. And it's not just volunteering. Here, um, I, I normally stay away from controversial topics, but in the last year, last two years, we had a number of things that people could say on social media, which would get them banned. Sometimes temporarily, sometimes forever. And so you don't need to wait until a once in a century uh, downtime for Facebook to have a, a big problem. You just yeah. need to uh, uh, tickle the AI in the wrong way, and the AI is going to put you in uh, AI jail, and anything that is attached to that particular thing would be unaccessible, which is why uh, I've observed through the years that, like, uh, if you remember the enthusiasm that we have seen for OpenID 2.0 once it happened many years ago, and then some of those things started happening, and uh, developers realized that having a, a direct relationship with a user or having a remediation path is useful. And so it's, mm -hmm. it's very common for people that want to accept uh, social providers to also use uh, uh, other mechanisms. And sometimes uh, there are also like other things you can do, like you can have uh, multiple social providers that accrue to the same accounts. So once again, thinking of those as factors kind of, that uh, you can use uh, account one or account two, but you unlock the same record on the application you are signing in with. So there are many, many tricks that one can place. Uh, but I think the bottom line is uh, relying only on social providers unless you are targeting that particular ecosystem and you need those APIs, like if you are on Android and you need to do something with the store, you must have a Google account. Mm -hmm. Apart from those cases, having some degree of redundancy is a good idea. Yeah, and I think it's, yeah, and it's not just for the outage case, which, you know, is probably not going to happen again for five years. You know, Facebook's not going to disappear themselves from the internet again. It's just not going to happen. So there'll well, be some new problem that that comes up, and uh, we'll see what happens. But yeah, it's it's not just those cases that you have to worry about. It's, it's if they all the don't other... commit to end Finsta, they might actually have issues. Don't, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know that, that thing that happened in which uh, uh, that senator asked uh, to Facebook. Uh, but are you committing to end the Finsta? Oh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So yeah. if we don't end the Finsta, I don't know in five years what's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll see how that how that all plays out. Fascinating, fascinating. So, yeah. Any other questions about the Facebook situation? Um, otherwise, we will move on. Um, Do feel free to drop questions in in the chat at any point, and we will get to them when it makes the most sense, though. Um, okay, uh, let's take a little um, uh, uh, a little a little break to talk about my tweet yesterday, because I think it was hilarious, and approximately three other people will also think it's hilarious. Uh, <laughs> So I was working on, um, I, I, I found this AI tool that generates text given an input. And you give it a couple of sentences as a seed, and then it will go and create similar sounding sentences uh, on the same topic that it has guessed. And you can sort of tell it like what kind of sentences you want. Do you want it to be a product description, a Twitter bio, things like that. So I was trying stuff out and it made some pretty fantastic sentences about OAuth. And I just uh, love these. So I think you should do an, um, a dramatic reading of those. Okay, let's see if I can, let's see if I can do it. At the end of the day, OAuth is just a way to communicate between services and users and as such, it's easy to grasp and non-controversial. 
Truth, truth. Go ahead. Go yes. Ahead. OAuth solved a universal problem, signing into a website, and in doing so, created a new problem. How does a site know it's really you? So, <clears throat> sounds nice. Flowery words, nice sentences. Um, any... <laughs> Any any clues from our uh, our lovely audience here? What is wrong with this sentence? Because uh, basically every single point in here is is incorrect. But I just loved what it did, and I was so inspired by this AI that I actually went and created a brand new Twitter account just to be able to tweet these sentences. And there's a lot more coming. Let me tell you. So. Highly recommend following this Twitter account. Uh, it is WTF underscore OAuth. And uh, just go follow it. And you will get a nice daily dose of humor. I have a whole bunch of tweets scheduled. So it'll, um, it'll, be, it'll be fantastic. I'm going to drop this in the chat so you can go and follow it. Um, but yes, even the bio... OAuth isn't just a way to log into your favorite sites. It's a way to log into the internet itself. But you you know what, Sylvia? You know I'm paranoid. It's uh, professional bias, I think. After uh, two decades of doing this, uh, I tend to be paranoid, as uh, all of my colleagues know. And I guarantee that a lot of people will read that and uh, they'll say, why WTF? This makes perfect sense. Because <laughs> it feeds, like the, the challenge about uh, AI is usually is like uh, garbage in, garbage out. Mm -hmm. And uh, just like AI can amplify biases and like uh, inequalities and similar, I think that here we'll observe, and of course I followed that thing. Uh, I think I was follower number two <laughs> of, the, uh, uh, of the entire thing. But <laughs> I'm convinced that... Uh, we will see over and over again the urban legends about off surfacing there because that's the AI is like this sieve that will just uh, yeah. shake the sand and the stuff that will remain are the things that are recurring and are typically the misunderstandings. The people are saying, oh yeah, off is used for signing in, right? Uh, so, and for that reason, some people will actually see it and have their bias confirmed. And say, oh yeah, great! And I go, I'm getting my wisdom, my daily wisdom from this thing. So, yep. um, if I were you, we can do whatever. But if I were you, <laughs> I'd add like a bigger disclaimer, like saying, uh, "This thing is not real. The cake is not real. Nothing oh, is yeah. real. Something <laughs> so that uh, you make sure that uh, people don't learn from it." Pro probably a good idea, um, because yeah, it may be too subtle for. Um... For, for most people who are going to be looking at this randomly in their timeline. Because Twitter is also going to start bumping these tweets into random people's timelines once more people start following it and liking stuff too. So Yeah. And I imagine um, like, uh, some, some of us will find, see one of those, find it hilarious, and hit retweet. Mm -hmm. And then some people in our uh, followers list will not find it hilarious. And I say, okay, I thought you tweeted this, so that must be... The, I don't think that many people think that, but some will think, oh, yeah, I tweeted it, so it must be right. And so now I will uh, make myself a culprit of spreading uh, misinformation. Spreading misinformation about OAuth. Yep. <laughs> we, wouldn't, we wouldn't want that. There's, there's already enough of that out there. Well, uh, if it starts the conversations, it might not be 100% bad. Like, uh, yeah. A lot of the problems we have in here is the classic uh, Donny Kruger effect in which uh, um, most people are in this uh, uncanny valley in the middle in which they know enough to be dangerous and uh, depending on personal inclination they can either remain uh, how to say learner uh, um, the new uh, I don't remember what's the exact term um, new like a new camera mindset and similar and then always question but some other instead might feel, okay, I put the, on the work, now I know everything. And instead asking the questions and uh, 
even discussing the basics sometimes leads to clarification that people didn't know they needed. So I'm, uh, I'm optimistic that this thing will be a good thing. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that was a fun little, Detail. fun little diversion. Um, definitely go and, uh, go and follow this account because, uh, who knows what will happen with it and you'll get in early on this very, very niche joke. Well, if we don't try to find some uh, amusement from time to time, our uh, field is uh, not particularly uh, shiny. Yes. So yes. <laughs> we need sure. to uh, do lemonade with uh, this stuff that uh, we are uh, handed down. I'm, gr I'm glad at least, at least one other person thinks it's funny. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Thank you, Sarah and I. Yeah, OK. Um, so back to, back to, back to business. Uh, what else? Oh, wait, no, before we get back to business, I did want to ask you a question. What is explicit flow? What is the explicit flow? I know what the implicit flow is. <laughs> well, uh, we don't want YouTube to ban us, so we can't read it. <laughs> now, the, the thing is that the, in the early days of uh, OAuth, there were uh, a number of uh, turns that people uh, brought up that uh, sometimes were like temporary turns that uh, even appeared in some specs and then uh, they, were, they were killed. But others instead were just people wrapping their head around this brand new thing. So remember the two-legged flow and three-legged flow. Mm -hmm. They were things. Like uh, people actually uh, used those terms even among ourselves, when we were discussing this stuff, we did use those terms. Uh, and then, uh, thankfully, they went down because now if you were to classify <laughs> flows by legs, we'd have uh, a full uh, beast uh, <laughs> zoo. <laughs> like uh, now it's far too many with far too many legs. But uh, they, I think that the explicit flow was just uh, a, a symmetry thing. People heard about implicit and then I said, okay, there is implicit. The other one, when there were just basically two or three, must be the explicit. And so they started using it. I don't think I've ever seen it in uh, uh, a spec, but yesterday I heard this term and I said, wait a minute, what is this thing? Did I miss it? And then I started searching for it and I found some instances here and there, but uh, I think that people used it as a synonym, as a code flow as opposed to implicit flow. But uh, I, I thought it was funny, so I, I tried to tweet something that remained uh, safe for work, and uh, we got a good laugh here and there. But yeah. 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 There it oh, is. Oh, and, and then Annabelle had a fantastic response. Yes, Annabelle piled on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> fantastic, yeah. 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 That is really good. So that was, um, I, I, I laughed at that as well. That was, man, yesterday I was just, last night I was just, I had, I was just out of energy and just cracking myself up between that explicit flow and the uh, AI text generator, so. Huh. Well, and uh, I actually had the, well, the week before one uh, uh, tweet go semi-viral, the one with the ID token and access token. Uh, oh, yes. It got like a, it's one of the few posts in which I got more reactions on Twitter than on LinkedIn. Usually <laughs> on LinkedIn, I have way more reactions than on Twitter. And instead of this time, it was uh, reversed. Apparently, it resonated with a number of people. Now I'm trying to find it. No, I, I don't see it. I was going to try to, sh oh, there it is. This one. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. And yes. it's true. Uh, we, we have this discussion on uh, almost a daily basis. Today, I had to do this again because uh, the thing is like there are so many things uh, appended into that. And I myself had uh, to go on a journey to convince myself 
that truly in every case that's true that uh, you really so, should use a uh, Let's 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 talk about that, because, yeah, I feel like I also had to go through this this journey every now and then of like, but what if what if you only need it for this, then isn't it OK? And it's um, it's a it's a tough one, because it seems like if you are if if you're building an app and you've just got the user to sign in and you got an ID token and you're like, cool, now I know who they are, then why not just send that to an API and have the API do the same validation on the same thing and then return some content? It seems like it's simpler. Yeah, it's like the naive uh, uh, approach, which kind of makes sense because also for um, the non-initiated, given that access tokens don't have to, but very often are in a JWT format. And you look at them, you say, well, there are not a lot of differences. And especially if you are not doing a delegated stuff and you don't have scopes, sometimes there are no differences between the two. But the thing is that the, the two main uh, reasons that we normally uh, use that I think are the most effective ones are, one is the matter of the audience. Like the ID token as, uh, as audience, the client. And so if uh, now you make it possible to use that token with the API, that would mean that the API has the same audience, so the same identifier as the client. And so not only that gets a bigger, bigger blast radius, because uh, now you have more opportunities to get a token that works for calling the APIs, mm -hmm. you had no chance of running any logic at the authorization server that is specific to the, um, to the API. So you couldn't uh, uh, actually place the claims that uh, are needed for that particular API. And there is also the fact that, uh, um, uh, uh, that actually uh, this token is tied to uh, sending the ID token to the client. Like there are mechanisms that are meant to protect you from the reuse of ID token. If someone steals that ID token and tries to use it again against uh, your uh, your client, mm -hmm. then uh, chances are that this won't work because uh, there was the nonce that was uh, issued uh, together with a request for the authorization uh, server. And then once you got the token back, the nonce was referred to it. And so basically the ID token is uh, comes with a mechanism for making it single use. But this single use doesn't uh, translate when you make an extra hop, when you send these uh, uh, elsewhere. And we have other mechanisms that we mentioned earlier, the standard constraints for protecting access tokens in the lag between the client and the API. But those mechanisms don't apply to the ID token. There are no flows that help you to tie the ID token to the channel between the client and the API because it's not meant to be used that way. Is that a fair summary? I think that's a fantastic summary. I was um, one of the blog posts I ran into as I was uh, thinking about this last week is this one from uh, Dominic Bear, which I should drop in the chat. And this is a small rant about the name ID token. Uh, but I thought that this was a very good summary. Of, of things in a much better way to think about it. So I know that we often talk about ID tokens as sort of being about the user, but it's really more about the authentication event than it is about the user. And I think as soon as you start to think about it that way, it becomes more clear why it's not at all appropriate to use it as an access token, right? The ID token is capturing, it, it, is, it is an authentication event. It's the user logged into this app at this time when the client had this nonce in the thing. It's happened at this moment in time. It, you should only trust this statement until this long. All these things are in the ID token. And if you think about it, you know, and it, might, it may also include some information about the user, like their name or their email, but it is mainly about, their, about the fact they have authenticated to into this app. So you are formally de jure 400% correct. Like <laughs> in the 
intent. Technically correct, the, the best kind of correct. <laughs> it, it is the best kind of correct in the court of law and IPF. Yeah. Uh, but then as soon as you step out, unfortunately, the behavioral economics yeah. start uh, having uh, an effect and making everything a bit uh, dirtier and uh, less uh, clear cut. From a formal perspective, that works and that was clearly captured in the intent of the offers of a spec in which mm -hmm. in almost all cases the id token is uh, bare bone it contains only that stuff and if you want user information in there you have to actually ask for it using the profile and you also need to use the correct response type and here, the funny thing is that I believe that this is the least, uh, the, the part of any spec that I know with the least level of compliance. Because uh, almost all the implementations that uh, I worked with contain, as soon as you ask for a profile, and in some cases, even if you don't ask, contain a very token uh, resulting from that will contain the profile information, no matter what uh, response type and response mode uh, you follow. Mm. And I think that uh, here the reason is uh, more historical and more about the jobs to be done. You know those classic uh, uh, memes in which there is uh, a corner for a, like a, a, a sidewalk that makes a corner, and then there is uh, the, a grass lawn, and you can see that clearly people cut the corner and always walk through the grass. And uh, that's, I think, a good uh, visual metaphor for uh, what might be happening here. People were used to things like uh, SAMO in WS Federation and similar, in which it was already a big deal that in order to cross boundaries between uh, organizations, instead of uh, assuming that you can get identity information using LDAP, as you can when you are within the same boundaries, now you had somehow to package those into a, something which is portable, something which is uh, easier to move than a cardboard ticket that can actually go on the public internet. And there was all this thing about claims, about the fact that you don't have to pre-provision the user on the other side. So we worked hard to convince people that federation was a good thing. And now instead, if you would have followed exactly this, uh, uh, this flow, you would have come back to the point in which you do need to call to an API to retrieve the identity information, which either if you get the ID token from the uh, back channel, or if you hit the user info for getting the user info, in both cases, you are calling, a, uh, a, you're calling an API from the side and in the process, you now also need to get a secret because in order to get an access token for a web app, you need to get a secret. So a lot of people just uh, couldn't find the motivation to even move toward the Predi Connect without stateful tokens. The, sorry, stateful is the wrong. We, uh, with tokens that contain at least some skeleton profile yeah. for the user. Because it was just ingrained in them that uh, I'm doing a federation, even if the, we know that it's an abuse of a term. But so you are absolutely right. And Dominic is right. The ID token intent, the framers said, yeah, this is a proof that successful authentication occurred. Let me tell you how it occurred. And the user information is more of a, I'd say, stove way. Uh, uh, but for a lot of people, that stopway is uh, the reason for which they, they are doing all of this. And I worked on products which had the V1 with uh, the Bourbon following the spec, and I got zero, very little traction until the product was modified accordingly. So I see both sides uh, of the yeah. equation. Yeah, that is a that is a tough one, and and I think really the you know, what happens when someone goes and applies a spec and actually creates a real thing out of it is a better indication of what the spec should have been than what may have been written down at the beginning. Because 
ultimately specs are not useful themselves until you apply them to something. Yes, so much, yes. In yeah. fact, I don't want it to be canceled, so I will not go into the details, but so many things are happening today in the world of identity, which are to me the uh, counterpart of the Cimarillion from Tolkien or uh, writing entire grammars of the Klingon language, which like, sure, the fact you can think about it doesn't mean that it exists in the world. It might, and uh, it might turn out that Klingon is actually easier to learn than English, and then uh, this fictional stuff becomes something that we'll start using for uh, uh, business uh, communication. It's possible. But uh, to me, standards are different. To me, standards are a lot of people have been trying in the real world to solve a particular problem. Their approach is similar enough that it makes sense to try to describe it so that now we can do what we are trying to do, solve the problems we're trying to solve in interoperable fashion. To me, imagining something that isn't there and for which there is not even clear uh, demand is uh, um, yeah. potentially a huge waste of time and resources. Then it might always turn out that uh, instead it's a fantastic innovation. And uh, But if I have to bet, I'm not a betting man, but if I were to bet, I'd rather bet on uh, on stuff for which there is clearly a need. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Um, we have a little bit of time left, and there's a good question here that's relevant to our current discussion. So let's uh, talk about this. It's a message in three parts. I'm trying to build, I don't know why it says no name. Um, I'm trying to build an internal OpenID Connect provider built on top of OAuth 2.1. I don't recognize which response modes are compatible with OAuth 2.1 since only the authorization code grant is supported. Can you tell me which of them are compatible? I feel like we were just having this conversation. Did you, are you no name? Did you slip these questions in? No? I okay. did not, but okay. historical uh, like uh, stars are aligning. Yes, so. yes. Um, no, we were just having this conversation because in the uh, OAuth 2.1 draft that I published two days ago, I forgot to do exactly this, <laughs> which was add a note about this exact point. And yes, in OAuth 2.1, the response type, well, OAuth 2.1, OAuth 2 doesn't define response modes, only response types. Response modes are all in OpenID Connect, but response type, the uh, OAuth Two defines code and token. Code being the authorization code grant, which Pixie adds onto that, and response type token being the implicit flow. And um, the security best current practice of OAuth 2.0 says don't use response type token, scratching out the implicit flow. And what we did in OAuth 2.1 was just not include it. So it's not even there to begin with. So it's, it's gone. OAuth does not talk about response modes, and it does not define any other response types. But there is an extension mechanism in OAuth 2 and OAuth 2.1, which is you can define your own response types, and you can also extend the flows in other ways. So it is intended that uh, it is intended that other specs like OpenID Connect can still define new response modes and or response types and define their own parameters like response modes. So um, what that basically means is if you just look at OAuth 2.1, you're going to not find response type token. And then if you read OpenID Connect, it can define new things. And I would still not recommend that you use any response type tokens in OpenID Connect at all. That's still a bad idea, but it's not prohibited necessarily because it's just not in OAuth 2.1. It would be all done as an extension in OpenID Connect. Now, this is the sort of stuff that needs to get like some little note in the 2.1 spec to make this part clear so that this question doesn't, doesn't keep coming up. But the 
the, the trick is that it doesn't really make sense to like forward reference because OpenID Connect is on top of OAuth and that makes it kind of weird for OAuth to be like, here's some notes about one particular extension that, you know, has extended the spec without having to mention all of the extensions of OAuth, of which there are several. Um, and, but this is obviously a very common one and a question that comes up a lot. Uh, but the, as far as like what we actually mean is do not use response type token at all under any circumstances. Getting an access token back in the redirect is a bad idea, even in OpenID Connect. But if you want to get an ID token back in the redirect, which is something that OpenID Connect made up, it made up ID tokens and they made up the mechanism to return them in the redirect, that's in OpenID Connect. And that's not disallowed by OAuth because it's just not in OAuth. And that's the kind of weird situation that, yeah. that we're in with these. And I would like to add that the reasons for which uh, uh, it's a bad idea to return a token in, uh, in the redirect don't apply to the ID token case. Let's say that for what we said earlier about intended usage, as long as you don't use the ID token like an access <laughs> token, yeah. then returning it from the authorization endpoint, which I think is better than saying in the redirect, because uh, uh, oh, sure. the traditional implicit is uh, uh, I the implicit was introduced mostly for single page apps, and it was a mechanism for delivering the access token to JavaScript so that JavaScript could perform most calls. And in order to deliver it in there, it was uh, typically returned in a fragment. And that stuff is like all sorts of challenges. So not only the fact that now you have this access token in there, but uh, it might end up in the history. It might be end up in like uh, in the um, headers that tell you the former redirect. So bad idea across the board. In the open ID case, you basically return the ID token, which in the, if you are doing this in the context of a spa, it stops there. It doesn't go anywhere else. And even if someone steals it, apart from a problem with the PII in the content, this token cannot be reused for the things that we said earlier, because uh, it is tied to a response. And for cases in which it is sent out, like the most common case in which I have to have this discussion, which people say, oh, but what about implicit? Uh, is when this flow is used for doing server-side sign-in, which you have an app that runs on your server, and the sign-in is based on redirect. Same deal as SAML. In that particular case, the ID token is sent to the client, which runs on the server. I know it's not very intuitive. Is through a form post, because this token can be big and all sorts of stuff. But the good news is not only is it non-reusable, it also will not end up in the URL. So it will not end up in the history. It will, uh, so basically all of the security considerations which make using the response type token a bad idea in every flavor of, of to that one, open ID connect, future stuff based on it, do not apply to that particular case. We have a PR problem because the implicit flow People think implicit flow equal access token in the URL. Instead, implicit flow just means token from the authorization endpoint. But then how you pull out and what kind of token is important. So we are having this discussion so many times, which is why I'm begging the offers of 2.1, Aaron, Dick, Thorsten, to add this uh, thing. And they graciously agreed to put it in the non-normative parts of the spec. And it's fine for me. As long as it's there and I can send the link to people, I'll be happy. Yeah, so the there's 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 two different implications of this, right? Because there's if you're building an app and you are deciding which flows to use, you can obviously choose out of the, the whole menu of what's supported. If you're writing a server and you, you want to be compliant with specs and give people the right options, that's where it's, um, you have to sort of make a decision. So you, I, I would not create a new OAuth server or OpenID Connect server that ever responds to the response type token, 
meaning sending access tokens from the authorization endpoint. Would not build that at all. Now, whether or not you want to let clients get ID tokens from the authorization endpoint is a question of how much of the OpenID Connect spec you want to follow, because it is part of that spec. And if you want it to be like totally like let your clients do anything that they're going to find when they're reading docs and using libraries, then you would have to build that feature as well and let clients get ID tokens from the authorization endpoint. And maybe the, maybe part of this PR problem is, is giving these things new names and not calling anything the implicit flow anymore. Cause it's yes. not really, I don't, is it even called the implicit flow in open e connect? I don't think it actually is. Um, I'm not sure. I think it's uh, spread across the board, but I agree that given new names would be good. Like for me, let's say like the immediate mode, something like that. Yeah, uh, yeah. Like the shortcut mode, like the sign in, uh, the front channel mode. Like we can find as many um, as many uh, synonyms as we want. I think that the, the thing is that OpenID is uh, very very stable. And so before there will be amendments to it, something big needs to happen. So mm -hmm. I don't know if that route is possible. Like for me, what's important is uh, that we clarify that uh, sending an ID token through the front channel is not this that does not trigger the same concerns that uh, led to the elimination of a response type equal token. Yeah. And there are actually a number of good reasons for which. If you look at many, many, many public services, that's actually how they implement web senior. And but we are out of time, so we can pick it up if there is interest yep. in the next uh, installment of uh, it. Is a, it is a it is a good yeah. topic, and the next next week is the OAuth two point one session at the uh, at the ITF, which means this will be discussed, I'm sure, as it always comes up. I'll try to make sure that it doesn't take up all of the time because there's a lot more to discuss as well. Yeah. Uh, but we will be able to summarize this more um, in the next OAuth happy hour, which I believe is on the calendar. So I will make sure that it gets posted everywhere. Um, so to wrap this up, the uh, if you do want to make sure you don't miss one of these happy hours, make sure you check out the calendar at octadev.events. And that is where we post these sessions as well as other events that our uh, friends at Octa and Auth0 are going to be uh, either giving talks at or hosting workshops. I have a couple of workshops coming up in November. So take a look at that. Um, there's a calendar feed you can subscribe to. And if you want to subscribe to only the happy hour feeds, then feel free to click on the happy hour tag. And there's an iCal feed for that as well, if you really want to get fancy. Um, so I'll make sure this gets updated with the next one as soon as we're done here. And um, yeah, thanks for coming, everybody. Thanks for all the thanks for the questions. Thanks for the good discussion. And uh, it was a lot to catch up on this week. So maybe maybe next time there'll be no. We're gonna have a bunch of interim meetings. So there's gonna be a ton more stuff to catch up on about as well. So um, yeah. all right. Thank you all, and uh, we will see you all next time. Bye. Thank you. Bye.